The Blob is a game originally released in 2008 on the Wii, but even before that it was released on PC as a free game developed by university students at HKU, University of Arts, Utrecht in the Netherlands. Back then the game and its themes were very different as the game and its concept of painting a city were created to visually demonstrate the evolution of Utrecht around its railway station and how that would look like within the next 10 years. Over the famously heavily political takes of the Blob game, which might be a surprise to you if you have no knowledge of the Blob or maybe only know it as this game about colors and painting. But regardless, I guess that basic concept of painting a town was there and that's what attracted the attention of THQ that bought the rights to it and got Blue Tongue Entertainment, a studio at the time mostly well known for tie-in games, to work on this concept to create an original game. Which is a gamble in my opinion, but I will say that I am glad that this studio got the opportunity to stretch its wings, so to say, creatively, to create The Blob, the game we are reviewing today. A game that has now in 2021 been released in pretty much every modern console, it and its sequels after being exclusives to the Wii for the past 13 years. And here I'll be reviewing the Switch version, which is fitting given this used to be a Nintendo exclusive, even if it's not really the reason for me playing on this console. Now this is enough of a preamble as I just thought it would be important for you to know the origins of this franchise as I personally didn't until I started doing the review on this game. So let's actually start with the actual review with the story. Already mentioned before, the blob has some very overt environmental and anti-authoritarian messages as the game centers around Chroma City being invaded by the Inked Corporation leading to a dictatorship where all the color is sucked out, even from its inhabitants, leading to the Blob, our main character, and a small resistance group to have to overthrow and take back the city from the regime by painting the city back in various ways that pertain more to the gameplay. The story though is fairly enjoyable, it's told mostly through visuals, during cutscenes there is no comprehensible speech as characters speak in some sort of gibberish language, but you always know what's going on with the very expressive little round characters and the visuals of this game being very striking, but more on that later. I would say my favorite part of the story is the feeling of progress as it really feels like the revolution evolves and takes hold as the game progresses. It actually feels like your work is making the difference and changing the tides of this world. Once again, this being best represented through visuals, that's kind of my whole opinion on the story of this game. It's really well told through visuals and aesthetics. And that can be good or bad depending on how you handle it, but I think here it's handled really well as these are fairly heavy real life topics but here there is almost a childlike playfulness and optimism in what would otherwise be a very dreadful and oppressive setting. And that's really good. Moving on then to other aspects of the game with the gameplay. The most eye-catching piece of this game with its core being about painting the world by touching it, so to say as you play as a blob a very round character that rolls around the level while painting it. Basic controls wise, the blob can roll around in the three dimensional space with the left thumbstick and control the camera with the right one. You can jump, which is all fine enough except for the fact that the blob jump is laughably weak and that he sticks to everything. And there is a reason for it. A big part of it is that the blob can stick to walls and do sort of a wall run. The problem is because of this feature that doesn't even get used that much, the most basic of platforming can become a bit of a chore. And you might notice in the gameplay me struggling with something as simple as jumping on a small building. Speaking of that, the blob's size is something important to mention because he is relatively big in this world, 
being able to jump buildings and jump on enemies to smash them and even run over pedestrians which is a good thing I swear you are just painting them not killing them this working as a mechanic where if you color a crowd of them they will drop a bonus item that gives you extra time in a stage as levels work within a timer but more on that in a second haha <laughs> Another thing to take into consideration with the size of the blob is that it changes. The more of paint you have, the bigger it gets within a limit of holding a hundred paint. Yeah, it's one of those vague video gaming numbers you can't really measure it or correlate to anything real. Regardless, the bigger you are, the slower and heavier your character feels. That being said, there is almost no reason to not just all the way max out the paint you can hold given this is also your health and also in a way your ammo as you expand paint when you attack and of course also when painting stuff and the added agility and speed of playing with low amounts of paint is just not that useful for all the disadvantages you get as i personally never felt i needed to lose paint to be able to do any of the challenges which leads us to talk about the world and its objectives. Your basic objective of course is to paint the world as you are set free in a big sandbox that starts out small and slowly opens up to you its areas as you acquire points and reach different milestones. And at other milestones you might also unlock other things such as new challenges or special items that color and bring back the life to an important area of the map for example. Doing challenges or missions is the main way to gain points but simply painting will also give you points and will often be the straw that broke the camel's back so to say in helping you reach one of those milestones. And in fact most challenges will have you painting in some way or destroying something that would stop you from painting. There are four main types of challenges which you can tell apart from who and the resistance gives you the challenge. Biff will give you the more action emissions, having you destroy a certain number of enemies within a certain amount of time. Then Zip allows you to run from one place to another through checkpoints, which suffer a bit from these checkpoints often being a bit too hard to see, especially since their smoke color already matches a color that you can paint the world with but they're okay I guess. Then the professor will have you usually changing enemy landmarks into rebel ones by entering them and using a large amount of paint usually of a specific color to convert them. And finally RT which has you painting a building or more often several buildings to a specific color. All of these work within a time limit unrelated to the already existing time limit of the level but completing the challenge will give you extra time for that overall level. Also a small thing is that with artist challenges, if the time runs out, when you restart, the building stay painted like you did when you failed the challenge, meaning it makes even the highest difficulty challenges fairly easy for Artie. And yes, while there isn't a difficulty option in this game, there is different difficulties within the challenges, signified by the amount of stars in them. So even without a straight up difficulty option, you can still just stick to playing easier challenges, given you just need the points to progress. And you can acquire them in various different ways, since you don't need to 100% a level to progress. But there is still an incentive to do it, of course since they also give you a lot more points. Now, while there is difficulty variation, I personally found that most challenges were fairly easy, or at least they were never frustratingly hard. A lot of the time limits in this game are very forgiving. It's actually a very surprisingly laid back game. I always ended up finishing the level with over 20 minutes left on the timer, and that's a lot when each level will take you about 30 minutes if you're just playing it normally. By that I mean not rushing it but also not trying to do all of it. That paired with the fairly simple challenges and it just ended up being a very relaxing game for me. That being said, that could also be considered a downside for many 
as there is very little variety and challenge types and it can get repetitive. I would honestly not recommend playing through this in one sitting. Instead, playing each level in a much more individual way makes for a better experience, especially since that each level is already relatively lengthy and big. Now, final thing I want to talk about the gameplay that I failed to mention this far and it's really important is how you acquire and mix color. Well, color here works on the principle of the primary colors and their mixing. So you can find these robots carrying color and hit them to absorb them and acquire their color of course. Or mix the color that you already have. For example, if you have yellow and a robot has blue, you absorb it and then you get green. And if you add red, then you'll get a brown color. Brown being the least used color, but you can get it by mixing all three colors in any order as long as it's consecutive. That's important to say because, for example, if you obtain green, like I mentioned before, then mix in yellow, then you will get yellow or blue if you mix in blue. I believe here this is working with the logic that adding more of the same color that was already in the mixture will just get you that color back. It's not the most realistic thing, but it does follow some logic that it's easy to understand gameplay wise. Now to give my final opinion on the gameplay and move on to the next topic, I wanna say I really enjoyed it despite its problems and odd design decisions that might not work for you like the laid back feel and repetitive nature of the gameplay. And that's the type of thing that you have to know for yourself if it is something that you would enjoy. Moving on to the graphics then, this game looks very striking again, going from the very grey and dull feeling of the world to beginning to be very lively with the colours towards the end of a level. As you paint the world, it is really a cool effect and I already talked about in the story about its implications, which I think are also pretty cool. The problems here really just come from the technical side. And not because the game looks bad, as I think that aesthetically this game has aged surprisingly well. The problem here comes from how the game runs, as it seems to be running with an unlocked frame rate on the Switch, which I just don't see the use for because the game clearly plays for the most part at 30 FPS in the Switch version and only goes to 60 for very short periods of time when there isn't anything on screen. It's honestly just jarring and I would have preferred it just being locked to 30. Now I only tried the Switch version so if you plan on playing on a different console or PC I would suggest looking into those specific ports as it seems that even those have their own problems. But honestly if it wasn't for those technical issues this would honestly just be a great looking game especially for its age and how those visuals incorporate into the story and the feel of the world really add to it. It is probably the best part of the game. Now soundtrack wise it's good. At first I was a bit disappointing as it let me choose the song entering a level which made me think it would just be kind of playing random background music while I was playing and that it wasn't tailored. But thankfully I was wrong, much like the visuals, the songs will go from fairly slow and quiet to a much more vibrant and catchy sound as the levels develop. It's all very jazzy and I think that style really fits here with the nature of the game. And while you can choose the song at the beginning of the level, each level does have its preset song that will just be the first option when entering a level, so the choice actually just ends up being a freedom to be able to play with other songs you might prefer in the soundtrack, which is really good. And overall, the music in this game just ended up being a very nice surprise. And this whole game was a nice surprise. The Blob series was for a long time called a hidden gem on the Wii and I think it deserved that title, even if it wasn't so hidden to me given this isn't even my first encounter with the Blob game. But more on that in the next Blob review. Here and now I am giving The Blob a 7 out of 10, a really enjoyable laid back experience that benefits a lot from being able to be played on a handheld like the Switch in my opinion. And recommendation wise, if laid back is what you're looking for then yeah play this game 
and the portability of the switch really adds to it but if frame rate to you is more important then consider other platforms like PC or the big consoles. Regardless of your decision though I hope that you enjoyed watching and please consider subscribing and liking and commenting all things that you can do for free here on YouTube and regardless of that I hope that you're having a good day and goodbye.